Bob Cigar Corner, the March 2020 edition. We're going to be calling this session Tips and Tricks, but actually this is kind of our basic Cigar 101, and I'm really excited about getting this into what they call the movie can, I guess. Jason's helping me out here tremendously. We've got some great people helping out tonight. Bryce Sandifer will be talking about pipes a little bit later on. And Jeremy Wilson's here and he's brought some goodies with him, so I really appreciate that. And this time of year, we get a lot of people in the shop that are just saying, gee, I don't smoke a cigar that often. Every once in a while I have a cigar and I don't know what I want to smoke and oh could you cut it for me or which end do you cut and I think I'll just light it with my with my Ronson all and they have a lot of basic questions they don't they don't know how to um, go through the process that much but what I really want to say qualifying this right up front is there is no wrong way to smoke a cigar and what we're going to share is little tips and tricks that I've picked up that make the smoking experience a little more pleasant, a little more fun. It's a, it's a great way to develop the hobby and maximize the enjoyment out of that cigar that you spent your hard-earned money on. I even had one, and this wasn't this long ago. I was over at uh, Lit a couple of months ago, and I had, I think it was a, a farce, Room 101 farce, and I lit the wrong end. I didn't enjoy it as much as I would have if I'd have lit the right end. Imagine that. But yeah. And, and they say, I don't know, what would the difference be? But anyways, I, I cut it and everything, and then I somehow got flipped around and I lit the wrong end. I had a terrible time that night. But it still, it was a, it was a cigar, and nobody said, oh, Bob, you're doing it wrong. It was just, I did it a little different that night. So what we're going to talk about tonight is some of the things we can do to maximize the enjoyment of the cigar. Once again, it's, it's nothing like where, oh gee, you're not doing it right. Well, you're doing it the way you want to do it. But watch this. This can be even better. And I got to tell you, most of the tips and tricks that I picked up, I picked up from customers right here at the Thunderbird, fellow cigar smokers, Herefords, that are doing something a little different than I am, and I wonder why they're doing it, and they say, well, it makes it more fun. And talk about more fun. One of the great things that we're going to be able to do tonight is share a cigar that uh, Jeremy Wolfson brought in. And I've actually, I'm going to tell you about the review. Usually I do a review later on, but I'm going to tell you about the review up front so you can enjoy this cigar with me, knowing what I got out of it. And this particular cigar, yeah, Jeremy's passing some around right now. It's the last Cowboy Sinistro, but the last Cowboy Sinistro that got a lot of fame and fortune was the Maduro version. This is what I'm calling the Connecticut version. And yes, I know these are tough times to say this, but Jeremy did bring a Corona tonight. So we're going to smoke a Corona. Hope nothing bad happens. And did you, did you find those? Did you find them? So, so what we've got here is a Corona, and just to show you one of the tips and tricks that I picked up over time is, I got one of these things way, way long time ago in, um, I think I got it on Amazon, and people always say, well, what size is a Corona? And sometimes on the wrapper it'll say, and sometimes it doesn't. But this thing here tells me that this is a 44 ring gauge, there you go, and it is five and a half inches. So I'm smoking a five and a half inch 44 ring gauge Corona. And I'm also noting that it has something called a closed foot. What a closed foot is, is they take the wrapper and they leave the wrapper longer than the cigar and then they fold the wrapper over the bottom of the cigar. Now, uh, when, when they roll a cigar naturally and they don't do this, the, the wrapper actually shrinks back a little bit from the filler. And you'll see that there's a, maybe an eighth inch reveal on the foot of it. And sometimes when you light it up and smoke it, you just get the entire experience. At least half of the flavor on all your cigars 
comes from the wrapper. So what Jeremy's company did on this foot is they left it long and then they twisted it and folded it over. So when you first puff the cigar, you're going to get just the wrapper without the filler and you'll get a more intense flavor experience and, and know what the wrapper tastes like. On top of that, I also noticed that the end part of it is wrapped with candela wrapper, which is a light grassy wrapper, even lighter than the, the Connecticut shape this is wrapped with. So you're going to get this burst of light grassy uh, sweet flavor when you first light it on the foot. Now, if you if you like Bryce, you're going to cut all that off because Bryce doesn't like close foot. Now, am I saying that's wrong? No, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying Bryce does it different. Bryce does it differently than we do. So, there's no wrong way to do this, but if you, if you light it and puff it, when the foot is still closed, it'll seem tight to you, but you get a different flavor than you get for the rest of the cigar. If you're Bryce, you're gonna cut all that off and be done with it and open up the cigar and light it the way you want to. I, I'd also like to note that this, uh, just to give you a little bit of the details about this, it's an actual USA Connecticut Shade wrapper, which is magnificent. Uh, Connecticut Shade's where it all came from for the lighter cigars, they've been doing it forever. Underneath that, there's a binder, which I find in any publications, but hey, I know the guy that made the cigar, so I found out. The binder's actually Cameroon, African Cameroon, which e has... Ecuadorian a, Cameroon. Oh, Ecuadorian Cameroon, which has a nice, light um, sweetness to it that's a little bit vegetal and a, a lot different than your typical darker uh, Nicaraguan blends. Underneath that, he's got something else that hardly anybody has. In the filler of the cigar is a leaf of Peruvian, and he's also got Dominican Republic leaves, and he's got Nicaraguan leaves. So you've got a Connecticut shade cigar with a candela foot on it to start out. You've got a Cameroon binder, which brings in some unique sweetness. Then you've got Peruvian and Dominican and Nicaraguan. Makes a nice, light to medium, well-balanced cigar especially complementing that, that Connecticut shade foot. Now to tell you what I experienced was that the draw was nice and open, the burn was just about perfect, it wasn't too wavy and I never had to relight it. It was a mild plus on the nicotine strength but what I really got on the um, body of the cigar, and there's a difference, the body strength is how strong it takes, how strong the flavors are. The nicotine strength, the only way you even know about it is because it makes you kind of lightheaded and it, 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 it could make you too lightheaded if you're not careful. But nicotine itself has no taste, it has no odor, it's just there and it, it amps up the, the strength of that cigar smoking experience. Typically that builds as you smoke through it. By the way, the, uh, if you're smoking a cigar and you think the nicotine's too much for you, the half-life of the chemical nicotine is two hours. So if you smoke a cigar and then you stop smoking for two hours, half of that nicotine has left your system. And then half again in the next two hours and the next. So if you want to pace your cigar smoking or you're worried about uh, the nicotine being too much to overwhelm you. The half-life of nicotine is two hours, so that, that's something that I picked up somewhere and a lot of people don't really think about that. They'll smoke a, a light cigar, then a heavier cigar, and then a real heavy cigar. Uh, some people start out with a heavy cigar and then like a lighter cigar because they don't like to get too um, winked out on the nicotine. But if you think about pacing your cigars, uh, the nicotine's halfway out of your system after two hours. Sometimes I do that. I'll have a cigar early in the afternoon and then not another one until after dinner, and I'm fine. It's, it's a great experience. So, I actually, I reviewed this, and I can't believe this cigar has been out that long. I reviewed this cigar July the 24th, 2018. Has it been that long since the last cow? I remember the day that came out. I thought it was still brand new. So, you did the pre-release. Ah, we had it before, okay, we had it before the rest of the planet, because we know a guy. 
So when I first lit it, I got a little bit of sourdough bread taste. That was probably the grass from the candela foot. And once I got past the candela, it got sweeter with notes of nuts and bread. Um, after I got down into about one third of the way in, and this is just me, and everybody's different, but I really got notes that reminded me of pecan pie. That was a nice nutty sweetness, and it, 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 once it got into my head, I couldn't get it out. So as you smoke through this, if you get those notes, I agree with you 100%. Another thing that's nice, if you retrohale a cigar, a lot of times that's much more amped up because all of the, your nasal passages are much more sensitive than your palate and your mouth. Well, the retrohale on this was very, very easy. It didn't have a hot, peppery bite to it. It wasn't sharp. It was a nice, smooth retrohale. So if you're not a regular retrohale-er, I would suggest using this as a try to try a little bit of retrohaling, which is just blowing a little bit of the smoke, not all of it, maybe the last 10% or so out through your nose and see if you get a different flavor note. Maybe pecan pie, who knows? Um, as I got down past the halfway mark, the pecan faded and it was replaced with a creamy citrus. That citrus being like a, a, a tangy, like a pineapple-ish type of tang to it with, with uh, a milky cream to it. Then, as I got down to the nub past the band, the citrus faded and it got buttery. So here's one little cigar, five and a half inches of pleasure. And you're getting pecan pie, you're getting citrus, you're getting cream, you're getting a, a grassy candela and, and butter. So what's not to like? Now, people ask, some people think I'm nuts because I taste these things. And if you want to know more about how to taste a flavor in a cigar, there's a couple of simple things and one that a customer actually gave me. I, I got to find him and give this back. Um, this is the complicated thing. And it was, it was devised in the wine industry. It's called Lene du Vin. Oh, that's a good picture right there. And what it is, is it's a kit. And in the wine industry, sommeliers use this to help them distinguish what the wine notes are in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a certain wine. This is a little messed up, but you can you can see there's vials there of, and each vial is labeled, and I don't want to pass it around because it's not mine, but it, it is available if you want to look at it. Each vial is labeled with a different essence or aroma, and the essences are not necessarily what you would think they would be. Some of them were different. The, the fancy schmancy sommeliers, this one has, I think, 12 in it. The real fancy sommeliers have kits like this with 120 different essences in them. And you can buy those for and a lot of money. Cheap. Yeah. A lot of money. And this, along with the, the booklets and stuff, it helps you develop, develop your, uh, your palate. I've got an easier way, but much less expensive, and it works for everybody. And not a lot of people do this. My son never does this. And that is smell your food. You're using the sense of smell more than the sense of taste when you smoke a cigar. You're using the sense of taste when you eat your food. My son inhales Whoppers. He doesn't use his sense of smell at all. And french fries. I don't think he knows what any of that stuff smells like. But if you're eating food you really enjoy, if you take a moment to smell it, That'll put, the smell is the strongest memory sense that we have of all our five senses. Touch, sight, all of that, they're all great, but smell is number one. And it's an old survival instinct. So if you smell your food, and I smelled my food when I was a kid, and I bring back like the pecan pie goes back to my teen years at Thanksgiving. And that memory of that smell comes up in this cigar. So if you don't smell your food, you're missing out on expanding the experience of letting your palate do its job. It's not that you have a good palate or bad palate. Everybody has senses, except, and there are some women in the room, I gotta say this, women have 150% 
of the sensory sensors for their palate than what men have. So when we don't smell anything and they smell awful smells, that's true, it's, it's a real thing. They have much more better developed senses than men do. And that's hereditary and that's evolutionary and that's survival. Because basically they got to make the food and they got to know when it doesn't smell right and all that stuff. <laughs> So, if, if you want to really enjoy the essence of a cigar, smell your food, get familiar with, uh, with, with what food-like smells are like. Uh, another side note, before Cigar Aficionado was created, that magazine that's been around for 20 plus years, cigars were just good cigars. What's that taste like, buddy? Oh, it tastes like a good cigar. Shut up and leave me alone. And then, Marvin Shank come along and he's got a magazine called Wine Spectator. And he's got like 50 or 60 sommeliers that work for him that, that uh, taste and smell and, and tell what all the wine notes are. So he starts a cigar magazine and he says, what are we going to tell people like what these cigars taste like? So he takes the wine experts on his staff that smoke cigars and he gives them all cigars and says tell me what it smells like well their reference point are all these wine notes oh it's fruity it's got a vegetal note it's got a little bit of berries in it that's when cigars started having flavor notes before then there were not it was just a cuban or it wasn't or it was a good cigar or it wasn't and that was all there was to it so that's just a little bit of history but i'm gonna I'm going to try and move on here and get this cigar lit, but I can't light it till I cut it. So, I'm going to try and show you, let's see, we got, how do I get the, oh, there we go. There's a lot of different ways you can cut your cigar, but all of them come at the closed end. When you see a cigar, this is the, the foot, which on this one is closed, and this is the cap. On the cap, you'll see there's a separate piece of tobacco, or two or three. They actually roll the cigar up to it, and then they put another piece of tobacco on top with this pectin-like glue, and that holds the cigar together. The curve on the cap of the cigar is called the shoulder. If you cut past that shoulder, you will take that entire cap off, and the whole cigar will unravel on you. Tons and tons of cigar smokers regularly cut down a fourth of an inch or a half an inch, and then they complain about the cigar unraveling. So the real enjoyable way, not right or wrong, but the enjoyable way to cut a cigar is just take as little of that cap off as possible to open up the draw and do it above the shoulder, which is the curved part where the cap uh, still is intact and holding the wrapper together. So I've got a number of different ways of doing this. On flat cigars, I like to use something called a punch. And a punch looks like this. The, the sad part about punches is most of them are really tiny. And I found the biggest punch I could find on the market. It's 11, 11 millimeters. And it's a, it's a good size punch. There you go. That's, that's about the biggest punch. I think it's made by, uh, I don't know. Zycar? Yeah, I think it's a Zycar punch. So when, when you punch the round punch part, you just twist it down into the wrapper only. You get it down past the wrapper and you pull it off and you don't worry about getting the plug out of the middle. What's, what's past the wrapper is smokable tobacco and you just want to leave it in there. I use a punch. I don't know if you've ever heard of a, like a CAO flathead or some of the cigars that are fairly flat at the top. Punch works well for me because um, it, it, it's square and if you cut off that, it just doesn't work. But a good size punch will give you a good draw and it'll, it'll open it up for you. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, and I like to do this on box press cigars. Box press cigars are basically square or rectangular. There's soft box press, which is kind of curved. San Latano, oval started all that. But they're rectangular, and I like to do something called a V-cut on, on the rectangular ones. And that cuts a nice deep V. 
And this is my eye. You've got one too. This is my favorite V cutter because it cuts a nice big deep V on a good sized cigar. You may want a smaller V cutter if you got a smaller cigar. I, I, I wouldn't use this on anything much less than a fifth, probably a 60 actually. So the smaller ones you can, you can do accordingly. But the big ones, it's not just the size of the blade, but the depth of the hole. Like I can't put a 70 in there, but I, I don't smoke too many 70s anyways. But when you go to buy a V cutter, look at the size and shape of the hole and see if it matches the, uh, the cigars you like to smoke. Another real popular way to cut cigars is with a guillotine. And the guillotine cutter is what you see tons of everywhere you go. There you go. That, that's a good example of one. And in this case, the, the back is flat. And guess why the back's flat? So you don't overcut the cigar. But there's a way around that. If you don't happen to have one that's... Um, that's got an, a closed back, put the cutter down on the table where you're sitting, put the cigar down on the table and the table stops the cigar from being overcut and then cut it all flat on the table. Uh, another nice note is, and we're smoking a, a thin, thin wrapped Connecticut shade. Those thin wrappers can get bunched up and then crack. Well, this lighter I really like because it's got serrated edges on its blade. The serrated edge is like a steak knife and that steak knife serrated edge catches all of the wrapper leaf and keeps it all in one spot and cuts right through it. It's like having a hundred little blades just like when you're cutting a steak. So that that's a good way to get a flat cut. There's another cutter. Oh here it is. And I don't know why anyone ever even bought this cutter because it's the dumbest thing I've ever tried. It's called the Shuriken, and actually, I don't know why anyone ever bought it. I own two of them. <laughs> and the Shuriken has pie-shaped blades up inside. Do not put your finger. I was going to say there's no wrong way to smoke a cigar, but if you put your finger in a cutter, you're doing it wrong. So this Shuriken with the pie-shaped blades, you stick the cigar down in there and it cuts all these wedges and then if you bite on the cigar it opens it up. Well the first one I got I had to try something new. I stuck the cigar in there and I gave it a good twist. <laughs> that was the end of that cigar. It just ripped the whole head off of it. So the shuriken is, I don't recommend it and I'd say don't waste your time or money because even if it works right it's it doesn't open the cigar up nicely. It, it seems like it's always blocked. So I'm going to go ahead and get this cut and get started on it. And uh, try and catch up with everybody in the audience that's enjoying a good Sinistro. Okay, so as you can see, I got that cut. And plain and simple. There it is. As you can see, I'm still just on the shoulder and I still can see cap around the bottom of that cut. Another thing I like to do is take what you call a cold draw. Along with the cold draws, you can actually sniff the wrapper. I don't get much out of this. This is pretty, oh. <coughs> yeah, it's like a, an oat field, like a nice oat field out, you know, out on a farm. People like the smell of foot. This one's closed, of course, but I always get more of a, a, an aroma out of the wrapper itself than out of the foot. Don't know why. And then you take something called a cold draw, which is just drawn on the cigar when it's not lit yet. Now, on this one, all I did was, was just give myself a hernia because it's blocked. It's, it's a closed foot. So to get around that, and I think I hit all the cutters, didn't I? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and move on to lighting. There we go. Oh, I, I forgot to show you something. And I really like this. And my good friend Scott is the master of this. 
I have failed at using this a number of times, but he has a better one than I do. You can see it on the overhead. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a scissors cutter. Now, Scott cuts his cigars with this regularly, and I think he'll be the first to tell you it's a developed skill. He had to work on it to get really good at it. But what he does with this is if there's a little notch or tab or anything on, on your cigar, he also trims his cigar and gets stems and stuff out of the way. So he uses this as a tool ongoing even after he's started it. So I, I just didn't want to neglect that. I wanted to make sure you were aware that that is an, another way of cutting a cigar. Now I'm going to go ahead and light it with one of my favorite lighters. Yeah, tell me about the nipple twister. Oh, I forgot the nipple twister. It, some cigars have pigtail caps, and you'll see it looks like it's called a pigtail because it looks like it's a little pigtail. They're there for a couple of reasons. One, they're kind of artistic, but the real, real big reason is you can twist that and it'll tear the cap right, uh, tear the cap right off, and it'll open it up. I can't do it. I, I kind of mess up my cigars when I try to do that, so I don't. Oh, there, here's a here's a pigtail cigar. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, there you go. And the theory is, and Jeremy's probably real good at this because he just he doesn't use any kind of cutter at all. But if you take this nipple and go boink, it, I'm not going to do it because that's. Oh yeah, that's a good cigar. So, that, the nipple twister. Leave it to Jeremy to remember the nipple twister. Thank you. <laughs> I was curious. So, I'm gonna go ahead and explain on these, on the lighters. There's a lot of different things you can use. But I wanna get into this cigar, so I'm gonna just use my, one of my favorites. It looks like a, a Zippo, sounds like a Zippo. Ah, it feels like a Zippo. It's a lot bigger than a Zippo. It's a, it's a jet, it's a jet, a triple jet lighter inserted into what looks like a, a Zippo case. So, if you really want to maximize your enjoyment of the cigar, starting out with a good light is, is really an important part of it. You see some cigars that they burn down one side or they're all charred or they taste bitter to you. You can avoid all that. It's really easy. All you got to do is just light the bottom and aim your flame at the inside edge of the wrapper and absolutely try. And one of the reasons I, 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 I'm glad we did Connecticut Shades is you can see if you char the, the wrapper at all, it'll turn black there. Just have a competition with yourself and try not to burn any of the wrapper. When you char that wrapper, you're taking all the flavor out of it. Also, this is about 18, 1800 degrees. This, I think, is about 800 or 1200 degrees. Tobacco burns at 800 degrees. I'm rounding, but it's about that. So these are more than hot more than way hotter than you need to be. This cheap little Bic has the same fluid in it as this jet liner. This jet lighter has air inlets, almost like a carburetor, that accelerate it and make it hotter. When you mix air and fuel and accelerate it, you get this jet light like that. When you do it with the Bic, it's just a lazy light that'll blow away in the breeze and it's the same stuff. It's colorless, it's odorless, it's not going to affect the taste of your cigar. So this is more gentle to lighting it than, than this, but boy, this is so convenient and easy that um, I'm just going to show you how we get this started. I just kind of ease up on it because it is so hot, I approach it like toasting a marshmallow, and I just go along the inside edge. And now I've got that candela wrapper glowing a little bit and you'll see when you puff on it that flame the, the it'll gas out and the, the gas will actually ignite you'll see that flame puff on it so it gets an even light all the way around the top 
which I did not. There, I missed right there. And you can also, a lot of people like to just give it some air. If you get an even start on the burn, you gotta have a pretty pleasant experience with the cigar. If you don't char down onto it, you're not gonna get that charred bitter taste. You're gonna get nice tobacco flavor. Now, different cigars are different quality, and it's a tricky part of rolling a cigar to get it to burn evenly, because it has to be well rolled and the tobacco has to be well selected. The elder Arturo Fuente used to deliberately grab a cigar off the, uh, off the rolling line and light just one half of it. And he'd puff on it for a few minutes, and if it didn't expand to the whole cigar, he could consider that below his standards. His Fuente cigars, he wanted to light just half of it and have the whole, have the whole cigar um, ignite properly. So it's a quality issue, at least it was with Fuente. Oh, another quality issue is if you get a high-end Padron cigar, like the 1926 but, <laughs> or, or the 1964s, they'll all have a single cap, and it's a very shallow cap. That's because the, the elder Padron used to use his fingernail to snap the cap off all his cigars, and he insisted that his cigars be made that way because so he could use his fingernail to cut his cigars. Now that I got this lit, I'm going to enjoy a puff or two. Oh, that's good, Jeremy. Thank you. Well, I'm loving me some Connecticut's anymore. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Good start. And you know, the Candela wasn't that different from the rest of the, uh, the rest of the um, Connecticut shade. Wasn't that much, maybe I talked through it, but it wasn't that much of a blast. So, other ways to light cigars. You may have heard of cedar spills or lighting it with a little cedar stick. And a lot of cigars come with cedar, you just snap off the cedar. But there's a company that makes cedar spills. This is what a cedar spill looks like. Ah, uh, this is hopeless. There. This is a cedar spill. And I had these cedar spills made for my daughter's wedding. And um, this is cedar, and I, I actually had it engraved for the wedding. And when I, probably smells good. Yeah, I love it, smell. it's kind of nice. Cedar is hard to control the burn, and it makes a lot of ash. But you just you just light up a cedar spill like this, and you hold that under the cigar, preferably like this. As it burns down, you'll see it'll. You got plenty of time to touch up your cigar and, and get it started and all that stuff. That's what a cedar spill is like. I also always kept a bucket of sand where I smoked with a cedar spill because instead of trying to put a cedar spill out, as nice as it smells, it just goes on and on. You just stuff it in the sand and it goes out. <laughs> Another thing a lot of people like are matches. but we have these little tiny, they're wooden. It's good to use wooden matches, but those aren't matches. This is a match. <laughs> these are kitchen matches. I get them at Safeway. All of this is wood. And the tip is the same sulfur stuff all matches use. You don't want that in your, in your mouth. You don't want to taste that. It, when, you, when you light it up, it flares up, and then it goes down. I'll show you what I mean. As you light it up, and you get that, wait for that to burn off. I'd even wait for the flame to get past that. And now, you have the same lighting capability as you had with the cedar spill. It's just a match. It's nice and easy, it's very natural, and once again, it's good to have a sand bucket around when you're done with it. So you can light them that way, and there are so many different lighters that, uh, there was one I was pretty excited about. It's called a flat flame lighter. And on the flat flame lighter, it's got 
a flat slot instead of a jet and you actually it actually has I don't know if you can see that it has a flat wide paintbrush like flame that you can kind of squish back and forth as you light the cigar I have not gotten used to this enough to be comfortable with it except for touch-ups I love it on a touch-up because I can kind of paint it back and forth and hit the bad spots and stuff and it's very easy to control and it's really elegant looking but it, um, it if you smoke an, a good sized cigar it, it's not that um, not that easy now what to avoid if you really want a miserable time I got two stories to tell you the first is don't use Ronsonol fluid like you put in a Flint Spark Zippo or any other lighter. Those fluids have a taste and an odor to them that you can smell on your hands, you can smell in the room, and you're going to smell it the whole time you smoke your cigar. Because you're lighting that fluid and you're drawing it in through the cigar, it's going to be with you the whole time and it's not pleasant and it doesn't, it takes away from your ability to enjoy the natural flavors of the cigar. So I would never use a Zippo on a fluid based. Um, Consider also the temperature that you're smoking the cigar in. I, I, I don't know. I met this guy at Smokey Joe's. He was the captain of the Coast Guard ship that went to Antarctica. And when he got to Antarctica, he went off on, uh, on to the bow of the ship and tried to light a cigar. It was minus 30 degrees or something. And he, could, he, couldn't, he got it puffed once and he couldn't keep the cigar lit. It was just too cold. Plus, it, it wouldn't be a pleasant experience. When I take a cigar out of the humidor, humidors typically are kept at a certain relative humidity and a certain temperature. They're maybe a little bit cooler. You may go out in the sunshine, you may go out in the cold, go anywhere you can get a, a good cigar. That cigar is saying, oh my God, I just went outside. It's freezing cold out here. I think I'll shrivel up my leaves in the filler and I think I'll get a little drier. Or, Whoa, it's 100 degrees out here. I think I'll swell my leaves up and I think I'll absorb some moisture. So, when you take the cigar out of the humidor, give it a chance to acclimate to, to what you're smoking and you'll have a nicer experience. This cigar I pulled out of the cello, what, an hour ago before I lit it, and I, I actually uh, set it down in the ashtray and let it acclimate to this room in the environment. And um, I, I'm going to have a good experience because of that. That all adds to it and helps. Now, the next thing I need to do is put it in an ashtray. Oh, before I get to the ashtray though, a little word about lighter maintenance. People come to us, what, hourly if not daily, and say, oh, my lighter's not working. Well. When your lighter is empty, that's the time to fill it. And when it is empty, it's full of air. And you can't fill it unless you burp it or let the press down on that air valve to let the air out. And then you can fill it more completely. Another thing that happens is you want to use the best butane you can get your hands on. We fix lighters by just purging the old butane that they got at a convenience store and putting in better butane. But beyond that, our secret weapon is, a com I learned this from a computer geek, canned air. So the jets, and it doesn't matter if you got something in there, just the smoke itself has residue enough that it, it'll, it'll, those are like little carburetor jets. And you want to, whenever you fill the lighter, not every time you use it, but whenever you fill it, you want to blow a little air around those jets. Also, on the side of the lighter, almost every lighter is like this. You'll see a little air vents. That's where the air goes in. When it's in your pocket, that's also where the dust goes in and where all the little pocket thingies that are in your pocket fuzzies that, that stick to your gummy bears when you put them in there. So, spray the hole on the side and get all the dust out of the lighter and the lighter will work better and you'll be able to re regulate it better. So, purge your lighters, wait till they're empty to fill them and use canned air when you fill them and you'll have a much more pleasant 
lighter experience, and you won't have to spend more money on buying more lighters. Although Bryce would love it if you would, but that's that, that, you got to make those lighters last a while. So now I want to talk about ashtrays. People overlook ashtrays. If they got an ashtray, that's fine. It's somebody else's problem. At least it's a place to put the cigar down because you don't want to hold it all the time. Well. I put a cigar down in an ashtray long enough and then it starts burning wonky. Now I don't think people think about this, they just think, oh my cigar is no good or I'm having a miserable time. But the side that's wonky is probably the side that sat down on the ashtray that's probably metal or cold and it conducts heat away from the cigar and when the heat goes down condensation goes up. You ever notice in your car when you get condensation on the window it's because of the temperature variation. So you put the leaf of the tobacco down in an ashtray and it gets real cold and then the cigar starts burning bad. So there's a few ashtrays out there. A good friend of mine, Michael Prendergast designed this ashtray. Actually, yeah, it actually, I think Romacraft used this for a little while. Skip Martin got his hands on it and he thought it was great. I can't hold this up too long because it's so heavy. Guy makes heavy metal stuff. But look at this part of it and you will see that if I put a cigar down on that rest part of that ashtray, it's only going to touch on the edge of the cigar on two, two surfaces, very small surfaces. So the cigar is not touching that cold metal hardly at all. And I've never had a cigar go wonky on me when there's this air pass underneath to help keep the cigar all at the same temperature. Another ashtray like this, which is also one that Skip Martin uses, is this puppy. And on this one, the part where the Cigar rest is just a very little bit of metal with air all around it. The cigar rests just like that, right there. Um, it looks like a simple enough construction, but think about it. There's air getting all around that wrapper. None of it's getting soft up against cold, hard steel. And the cigar's going to burn more evenly. Simple stuff. Another trick on ashtrays is a lot of people, mostly ex-cigarette smokers, love to dress their cigars because dressing your cigarette and keeping that ash down keeps you neat and clean and doesn't make a mess. The ash on a cigar is your friend. The longer you get that ash to stay on, the cooler the cherry or the combusting part stays and the ash acts as a filter. If you drop your ash, I'd even advise you not to take a puff on the cigar till that cherry dies down a little bit because when it's really hot it's because air came rushing at the, the exposed burning part and it got hotter when it gets hotter it'll get out of its out of its comfort zone for taste it'll get a little bit bitter and a little bit sour or more peppery that's because you're always dressing your ash now I've seen I've seen people on television on YouTube and all kinds of blogs where they're constantly dressing their cigars. Highly, it, it, it makes it, it, it makes the experience less pleasant. Just let your ash stay on as long as it naturally does and just tip it or roll it when it looks like it's about to fall. But don't encourage it, don't eat, especially when you get down towards the end. You will have a more pleasant smoking experience if you, if you keep that ash on the cigar. Speaking of which, my cigar went out. Now what am I going to do? Well, I, if the cigar went out, I do want to get past the ash. So I'm going to roll that ash off a little bit so I can get down to fresh tobacco. And once again, I am just going to paint a little bit of heat and light on the inside edge of just the wrapper. I'm not even going to worry about the filler. The filler is made to burn. But when I get that wrapper started, just on the inside edge, so I'm not scorching it like that. I've done all I've got to do. Another note about 
small cigars versus big cigars. And this is, boy, I can't believe, I must tell somebody this every single day that I'm at work. People buy big fat cigars and they worry about them being so strong it's gonna knock them out. A good comparison of how cigars are constructed, plain and simple. Think of uh, a mixed drink, scotch and soda, rum and coke, whatever you want. And I know this isn't an exact comparison, but it's close enough. So let's say you get in a scotch and soda. The wrapper of the cigar is the scotch. This is where the money went. This is where the quality goes. This is this one leaf around the edge because of its taste and its uniqueness and everything about it costs three or four times more than anything inside. The binders just to hold it together and add whatever magic chemistry the, the blender wants. And the filler is like a pile of leaves and it's there to burn. The wrapper, a lot of cases, won't hardly burn if that filler's not in the middle. So the wrapper is like the scotch. The filler is like the soda. So let's think about that. If you've got a 70 ring gauge cigar, you've got a lot of soda and a little bit of scotch. So you're drinking a bigger glass of scotch with a lot less kick to it. So if you get, now this doesn't matter on length, this just matters on ring gauge. A big fat 70 ring gauge cigar, bottom line, is watered down compared to a Lancero. You really want to know what a great, magnificent um, wrapper leaf tastes like. Try a Lancero because the ratio of the wrapper to the filler is much closer to scotch on the rocks. Now, I know every blender on the planet would argue with me saying, no, they put a lot of thought and everything into their fillers, and it's true, but those fillers are deliberately picked further down on the plant where they're more burnable and, and less uh, aromatic and less, less uh, rich in nicotine. So when they say they put a lot of lajero in the middle, yeah, they put lajero in the middle along with sec good get the other stuff too. And basically the thinner cigars, uh, and I like a Toro at about a 50, 54 ring gauge, and I used to smoke as Nathan knows, a lot of 70s and a lot of 60s. But I'm getting more strength and satisfaction out of the thinner cigars than I were than I was out of the fat cigars. Just kind of a side note, because that comes up just about every day. Oh, two other things that come up every day. I want to smoke a cigar in my car. How am I going to do that? Yeah. Well, I got this. Watch this. This fits in a cup holder. Ha, ha, ha. Now, see that? That fits, that fits any cigar, and it's, got, it's a spring clip. It, it's not going to hurt the cigar, but I'm going, I'm in, oh, I'm in my Corvette. Um, I'm out in Maple Valley, and I'm going around Lake Ravensdale, and there's a sharp curve. This is right before the high tension wires. You know, we're, you know probably, yeah. And there's a nice curve and a down, and I think I can get that 25 mile an hour curve at about 45 or 50. Oh, but wait, I got a cigar in the car. It's gonna tip over. I don't care. This is not going anywhere. I can go around corners, I can go around bumps, I can go over speed bumps, I can do anything I want. That cigar is gonna stay there. And the ash is gonna drop right there. I love it. It's made by Stinky. And it cost me like 10 bucks. So I'm just saying, if you're going to drive, at, or will this fit in a motorcycle cup holder? I don't know why you would want to smoke a motorcycle. With a windshield. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it. Believe me, it's come up. I don't care how strong that clamp is. Now, when I'm done with this cigar, I put the butt down in here. I shut it up and there's no smoke in the car. This will go out on its own because there's no oxygen in there in five minutes. Yay, bro. I wish we sold them. We don't. We did. <laughs> but, Remember we had them? Well, we had the screw top. I didn't like the screw. Did we have the flip top? Love that ashtray. Love it, love it, love it. Oh, and one other thing. And this comes up every day. Ta ta Tabo, is it? Tabo is one of our customers. Now I have 
I'll show you that in a minute. But a lot of customers like to smoke their cigars right down to the nub, finger burners, they call them. This has the, Tabo makes it, and it has the Thunderbird cigar logo on it. It looks like a cigar. I think he makes them on his kitchen table. And it's got a, uh, a corn, corn, on the cob. corn on the cob holder. And you just stick your cigar on this thing and you finish it up right to the nub. And it's, he, we sell these as soon as he can make them. But I, I couldn't resist showing you that. That's a fun thing. Uh, if you want to store cigars, I've got uh, tubos that these actually, this will keep the cigar at least overnight, if not longer. So uh, I would go with the highest quality you can get your hands on. I've got another one that's a three cigar and it's leather with cedar in it. And I can actually put a Bovita pack in there and I can keep a cigar in there about a week and it's fine. It takes, it takes three. So those are the hints and tips that, did I skip anything or miss anything? Mm. I really like, I'm getting a box of these. <laughs> these are good. I know a guy. Oh yes, I did skip some stuff. Sometimes you may have problems with your cigar, like it's tight. I highly recommend, and actually Nathan, I think, used this tonight. This looks like a pen. It actually has a pen clip. You can put it in your pocket. And it's made by a dentist. It's called a perfect draw without the T on the end of perfect. And it's got a, um, don't know how well that's showing up, but it's got a, a pointy tip and the serrated edges on the drill are sharp this way as well as that way. So I twist it into the tight cigar and I pull it out and it actually cuts the over packed tobacco leaves and pulls them out. So it gives the leaves remaining room to breathe. I've tried a lot of things where they got just a rod and it just pushes the cigar out of the way and, and other stuff. Nothing's worked as well as this. I have probably saved hundreds of dollars worth of tight cigars with this. So I use those, I use that regularly. And another, and I'm just bragging now, because I'm gonna show you something nobody can get anymore. But, but it's been responsible for me getting to meet a lot of cigar guys. Because I, I take this out in a, in a cigar lounge and I say, and they, they all, people I don't even know come up to me. That's, I think that's how I met Nathan. People come up and say, what the heck is that? And what it is, they don't make it anymore, is it holds the cigar. The Bose thing does the same thing. And if I'm smoking down to the nub, it holds the cigar in place. It's called the Stub Cigar Cigar Stub, and I got one. I had a lot of fun with it. Can't get them. They're gone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so those are all those those are all the uh, different accessories and tips and tricks. One other thing, and this is actually this has paid for itself a million times. This is a little vial made by the same guy, the Perfect Cut guy, it's called Perfect Repair. And what it is is it's cigar glue. You shake it up. And if your wrapper breaks or rips or anything or blows up, you can paint this little cigar glue, blow on it for 90 seconds, and the cigar is all better. I mean, it completely saves bad, bad cigars. So I, I use that more often than I'd like to admit. So anyone else have any suggestions as to what, what's uh, uh, a good tips and tricks for just getting more familiar with cigars, questions or answers, anything? I'll oh, one other thing. When we get down to the bottom of the cigar, 
this is a pet peeve of mine. I say there's nothing that you can do wrong with a cigar, especially if, if you're in a, a public environment. <sighs> please, please, please don't squish your cigar out and try and get the flame out. That is the stinkiest thing ever, and it's an anti-cigar smell. It's the smell of an old, dead, stale cigar, and people that typically do that are ex-cigarette smokers who had to do that because Smokey the Bear told us we had to. Stub out that cigarette. Well, if you just put a cigar down in an ashtray, it's going to go out in less than five minutes. Uh, unless you're drawn on this cigar, it has no capability to stay and live forever. So, um, that's, that's my last bit of tips and tricks to share in terms of how to finish the cigar. At this point, I really want to bring Bryce up. Bryce Sandifer's an expert on pipe smoking, and he said that he would share with us tonight how to get that bowl started in your pipe. And even more importantly, he calls it cadence, but I call it the rhythm method. And apparently, there's a cadence to smoking a pipe that's totally different than smoking a cigar. And I'm still trying to get used to it. Um, also, apparently, the cadence can be different for different tobaccos. So, without me rambling on anymore, I'm going to bring Bryce up here and, and see if he can't enlighten us a little bit on how that stuff works. Sure. Thank you, Uncle Bob. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for coming, everybody. I really appreciate it. We'll reset up here. Thank you. Thank you. Get out of your way. Take this chair. I'm going to use it again to roll yep. this out. All right. Just kind of how long we did last week. I'm good. That needs to be washed. You guys had to go through a whole bobs just to get to me. So. Yeah. Well, they can fast forward. <laughs> yeah, they can. Ship it to life. Watch out! Watch that wire, because that's holding the camera up. Kick. Okay. Yeah. So. He's right. There is a cadence to it. Um, a lot of times you'll see people up there, kind of just railing away at the pipe and uh, they're smoking it usually pretty hot. Um, you want your cadence to slow down a bit. That's where you're gonna get most of your flavor from. You might want to turn it because I'm gonna, uh, I won't pull the wire, but you might want to turn it because I'm gonna be packing it for him here. Oh, so we can get the angle down. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the cadence to it is not very complicated. It's just really slowing yourself down. So you're not just under puffing or over puffing on a pipe, which is a, a real problem when you're first starting off because you think just keeping it lit is, uh, is all a part of what it is, but it's not. You want to actually, the, the highest your cadence should be really should be right at the very beginning and at the very end. That's getting it lit. And towards the end of the bowl, you'll notice it's harder to keep lit because a lot of that ash is blocking the air to that to the uh, to the amber. So let me grab some tobacco here, and uh, I'm doing uh, Peter Stogaby's Bullseye Flake. It's kind of a uh, way to lead into the fact that Max Stogaby will be here next week, and we'll be doing that pipe event. But he'll be in here going over kind of the uh, the beauty of how a lot of these blends are created. And so, take a little bit more out here. I don't know how much I'm going to need, so I'm just going to quickly grab a little bit here. But I'm going to go quickly go back over the, the repacking of a pipe because that, that is another issue. And uh, I think you guys remembered I told you guys the best way to really enjoy flake is really. There's a lot of people out there that know how to pack a pipe with flake, but we'll get to that later. That's, that's a more difficult way to pack your pipe. It's and what's that? 201, not 101. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's 201. Course. Yeah. So I'm just going to quickly pack this up for you. I'm going to show you the different ways to pack your pipe that are, are successful, and then we'll go straight into cadence. So. so that was all like curled up, and you just broke it apart so easy. Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. I mean, 
when you break this flake apart, it's that's all a lot of tobacco is in the first place when it comes out of it. Uh, manufacturing, I mean, a lot of flavoring that they're going to do and then they let it rest a little bit and they pack it up and sell it. But flake is, is I think you'll find, is where a lot of natural flavor is that um, when they hot press these, these flakes together and they leave them in that form, as long as they can, can those flavors will marry together. So and you're just tapping on it and yep, it brings it down into the bowl? Yep, this is called the Frank method. It's really the method that I've come to love. And uh, all I'm doing is I'm doing is I'm pulling all those little stem pieces out that are harder to uh, to light out of there. And now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab exactly the uh, the bowl right there. I'll put it right on top. I'm going to use my thumb right there. And sorry, my hands are a little shaky today. I've had like three cigars and not eaten today. So and I'm just taking that loose stuff out. And now I'm just going to. I'm not putting pressure on the uh, on the tobacco itself. I'm just reviewing from last week on how the Frank method works and how to keep your uh, your draw from being too tight and uh, not too loose. And really, this is the best method right here. So see, I've packed it up right there and got a great draw. So so when you tug on it, it's not tight or anything. Nope. It's not. You want to try? No, no. <laughs> is that a Corona? <laughs> But it's just level with the top? Yep, it's just level with the top. Sometimes I mush it down a little bit farther. But with this flake, I know that it's not in ribbon form. I'm not too worried about it expanding out of the bowl too much. When it's in flake form, it doesn't do it as much, believe it or not. Um, so, I'm ready to go. So, I'll show you guys the match method first. And then uh, maybe I'll pull out another pipe and show you guys the... Uh, but really, if you can do the match, you can do the, you can do the lighter. Uh, the lighter is just a pre-lit match, really, in theory, right? So, uh, we'll start with the match. So, I usually go with you. I'm going to tear them out. All right. I'll let that sulfur die off a little bit, and that's that right I let that one go out. Oh, I forgot my tamper over there. It was my bag. Cardinal Sharon. Where's your bag? Right here. Oh. It's not going to light the whole thing. You're not trying to, again, this isn't a race. You'll hear a lot of people say, well, it should only take one match or two matches. It takes as many matches as it takes to light your bowl comfortably. It's not a race. You're not trying to impress anybody. All right. So right now I've lightly toasted it. I'm going to probably give it another toasting. You have to go around the edge to get the edge of it all lit. It mm -hmm. seems like when I do that, it just lights in the middle. Well, yeah, you want to go around the bowl as much as possible without scolding the rim of the bowl. That's another thing that a lot of people, when they get a brand new pipe, they get that pipe they light it and then two or three times after they've smoked it you look at the the rim of the bowl and it's all scolded and that's why taking your taking your time really helps out so see I've done it again it's another toast right there it's getting a little bit closer you're probably thinking to yourself well at this point I might as well just light up a cigar but trust me it's <laughs> all right so I've got a good toast on it now so it looks like I'm gonna do it in three matches um, I usually tamp it to where, it, and if you do get any of the, the ribbon or anything that's starting to go outside the bowl, just use your finger to get it back in there as soon as possible and it won't scold it. So at this point, it's completely black. Let's zoom in on that. See that? Mm -hmm. and it's ready to go. And then I'm just going to use this last match and then I'm, I'm done. See my cadence is a little faster when we first lit it up. That's normal. You're trying to get it all get it all ignited really, really well. 
So you're drawing more air through the tobacco mm -hmm. than you normally would just casually sitting there mm -hmm. smoking. And once you've got a good nice lit, you can kind of let it go a little bit. Now when we talk about cadence, you'll see guys over there, here, mile and gallon around. But do you see that little bit of smoke I'm letting out right there? It's like a cigar. If you just sit there, and it's just plumes of smoke going crazy on you. That's not really what you want. That's not going to give you your best flavor because what you're really wanting to do is a slow burn on it. You want it to be slow. You'll, you'll get to taste a lot more of what's in that blend as opposed to it just being red hot fire burning the tip of your tongue. And you're not going to get much out of it. Now, just real quick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to load this other bowl up just to show you guys. And this is why lighters are more common, even though I do light my pipe usually with a, uh, with a, uh, with a match. That's just because I like it. It's just kind of a habitual thing for me. And uh, I'm gonna pack this one up for you guys real quick here. And it's the same process. And we'll keep, we'll keep going over cadence after I load this one up. Anybody have any questions? You don't have to wait to the end if you don't. If you have questions now, nothing yet. That's the same, same tobacco, right? Same tobacco, yep. And uh, this is a Virginia Perique right here in a coin form. Um, I love it. It's been one of my favorites for a long time, especially good uh, with some age. I can't stress enough the uh, process of aging. It's most important with uh, with pipe tobacco than any other form of tobacco. Um, I do all kinds of forms of tobacco, whether it be cigars, chew. I still chew to this day. Uh, I still dip occasionally. About the only thing I don't do is cigarettes. But of course, you don't see people aging cigarettes very often because they're pretty ready to smoke them. If and, I if my bowl starts getting really hot so it's hard to hold in my hand am i over smoking it yeah that's that's that probably means your cadence is a little fast or a lot fast depending on how hot it is i mean if you're if you can taste the wood i've, I've had this happen to me before with a really cheap pipe um it burnt really really hot and i think we talked about this one time about um some pipes are not made like others and um you'll get, that wood will actually cut well, at night on you if it's a really cheap pipe. And you see it a lot more with pipes that are not made to be, are, are not made out of briar. Um, and you'll see those on eBay a lot. And I warn you guys, uh, be careful with those because they will, uh, they'll, they'll light up on you. Does the bowl size matter? The bowl size does not matter. Um, it does matter what kind of blend you smoke in a large bowl. Uh, a lot of people use larger bowls for Englishes. And when I get into Cadence, I'm using one blend right here, and it's it's a rather easy blend to smoke. It's a uh, Virginia. Virginias are easier to smoke, but if you're not careful with your Cadence with Virginias, you will burn your tongue. They are not forgiving. Um, they are usually for people that have dabbled in aromatics for a while, maybe moved on to Englishes a little bit, kind of cool smoking uh, uh, blends. but. If, uh, if you're not careful with the Virginia, it, it, it'll get you, but um, with, uh, I tend to smoke uh, Englishes a little bit faster in Cadence because it's got these big chunks of Latakia in it, right? And those Latakia's um, uh, flakes, they're a little bit more difficult to ignite, but once they're ignited, the heat from each one will actually ignite each chunk of, uh, of uh, the other Latakia, so you don't have to keep relighting, hopefully. But it's okay if you do. Like I said, if you got to relight, you got to relight. Same thing with the uh, with the with the light with the uh, match. I mean. So this is a whole fresh pipe. You know? It's a whole fresh pipe. Yep. Now I'm just going to go over how to use a lighter properly. Okay. You're going to circle the bowl. All right. If you see a portion of the tobacco isn't lighting, go over there and focus on that. Try not to focus on one area for too long because the heat of that will scold the sides of your your bowl. So you want to try and keep it moving. There we go. Do you retrohale with a pipe? Mm -hmm. I mean, but don't, you know, when you light up a, a pipe, you're not usually in 
deep conversation like you are with a cigar. Pipe is a much more silent hobby, right? You say a few words to your pipe is too hot. I don't feel this side. I'm not worried about that side. I feel where my thumb is at, and that's why I always keep my thumb right here. And if it starts getting hot, I put the pipe down, and I let it rest, and I come back to it. Let it go out on its own. If it starts getting really, really hot on you, and you're going to run into this, I promise you will. Your pipe gets hot, and this is why I use really thick gauge walls also. I don't run into that issue hardly at all. But if, you, if you're smoking like Savinelli bowls that have like, you know, a quarter to three-eighths uh, of an inch side bowls on it, you're going to run into that. And uh, especially with smooth bowls, you're going to feel it a lot more. The, rustica the rustication on this, it actually, you won't feel it getting as hot, so that's good. Um, but you want to make sure that you're not so aggressive that you cause there to be integrity issues in your pipe. Um, that's the number one way that you'll end up getting those, those issues um, with burnout. And that's a real thing that happens, um, especially with pipes that are not of, I'm not saying that factory pipes are not of the most primo uh, briar, but the guys that do like a lot of custom pipes and things like that, they, they have little honey holes that they go to to get these really kind of uh, primo stocks of uh, briar that can hold up, they're, they're closer to the core of the root. So anytime you see a root briar or anything like that, you know that that's pretty much the most highest conductive uh, wood that you're going to get for heat. So when you see people that say this is root briar, like Dunhill, they have a root briar series that that can hold a lot of heat. You're not probably not going to get a whole lot of heat on that. Um, but not every pipe is made the same, like I said. Um, so cadence is important, especially when you're starting off. You're not starting off with $200, $300 pipes that have the best stock, you know, uh, briar stock. You're starting off with usually lower end pipes. I mean, I'm not saying you get what you pay for, but a lot of times they're not using the type of briar that can handle the type of abuse that say, I don't know, an Ardor or some of these other guys are buying up. So keeping a good eye on your cadence is really, really, really important. Again, just take a puff, puff or two here and there, and you want there to be low smoke output. You don't want these huge plumes of smoke. If there's huge plumes of smoke, that means that ember is burning a lot of tobacco at one time. And you don't want that because it's, you're going to taste that ember and not the actual um, the tobacco. A lot of guys that are really experienced, they're sitting there puffing and you're thinking, is their pipe even lit? <laughs> it is. It actually is lit, but it's, they don't want a ton of smoke off of it. It's not a comparable thing on smoke, smoke input to cigar smokers. So cigar smokers that come over to pipe smoke, they expect, you know, these billowing, you know, things of smoke, and it's not the same, it doesn't work the same way, especially, it's a totally different leaf. I mean, yes, there are cigar leaf blends um, in, in the pipe world, in fact, we have some, but it's not, it's not comparable. Um, it's comparable in a lot of ways, but not in that way. So, does anybody have any questions about, yes? I have sat down with pipe smokers, mm -hmm. and I struggle with, oh gee, is this side lit, is that side lit, is my bowl hot, am, am I getting the right amount of smoke, did I, did it get bitter on me? And they're sitting there like they're in a dance with their pipe. Yeah, and it is so natural mm -hmm. um, that they seem to be in a, in a rhythm and enjoying naturally this sweet spot of what smoking a pipe's all about. And I just can't get there. I watch it and I admire it and I think, wow, that's wondrous. And then I look at my pipe and I did something wrong and I try to make up for it by puffing extra hard and that doesn't work. Yeah. I, I guess this is something that's a learn. It is. It's it's totally a learning experience. You're going to go through a hundred different ways on how to light a pipe and how to keep it lit and how to smoke it. What I'm here to do is trying to get you thinking about a lot of the things that you're probably not thinking about. Right now you're thinking, keep the pipe lit, keep the pipe lit, keep the pipe lit. That's not the thing. It's not that. You want to learn how to taste the tobacco. Keeping the pipe lit, that's fine. If you want to ignite the thing and let it burn through and dry, you know, get really dry blends and throw it in there, 
and blow through it, that's fine. You're not going to get the best bang for your buck on why a lot of these blends are really, really uh, well thought and why they put a lot of this stuff into it. Now, if, um, if you're smoking a blend and it starts to taste hot, um, you're probably going to get out of the hobby fairly quickly because you're thinking, this is garbage. I don't like it. I personally ran into that, uh, that wall whenever I got into Virginia's. I was like, man, this tastes like cigarette smoke. And it does, because what's in cigarettes? Virginia leaf, right? So it wasn't until I, I started slowing it down. You know, when a cigarette is going, there's a big amber in the end. They take a bit, these huge puffs and they barrel through a, a cigarette in like, I don't know. What's it, what's it take, like 10 minutes to get through a cigarette or something? Yeah. I don't know, I don't, I've never smoked before. But when you're smoking a Virginia, all right, in a, in a bowl, you're not looking for the same things that you're looking for when you're smoking a cigarette, right? You're looking to taste that leaf. Same with Latakia. And again, let's move back over to English just real quick here. When you're smoking in English, your cadence is going to be slightly different. You are going to bring your cadence up slightly more because those chunks of Latakia are harder to ignite. And by that, you'll know what I'm talking about. Whenever you go to put that in there, some Virginias uh, or some Englishes are done a little bit better than others. Some of the uh, the ribbon cut for Englishes are actually, they ribbon cut the Latakia too. Whereas a lot of the Englishes that you'll run into use a ribbon cut Virginia and they use a broken flake Latakia. And those broken flake chunks are very hard to ignite when you first do it. So if you go through three matches for a Virginia, plan on going through about five with a Latakia, with a Latakia base if it's got those chunks. Are aromatics as a category fairly similar in smoking characteristics. If you dry an aromatic out properly, aromatics are the easiest to smoke because they're almost always an aromatic form. I mean, a, a ribbon form. Uh -huh. Ribbon is the easiest to start off with. I probably should have started you guys off by doing that, but so again, I was trying to uh, do my Peter Stokeby lead in there. Yeah. Um, but ribbon, uh, when you when they, they cut that perfectly even, almost across the board, and they, and they create that ribbon cut, and it's really easy to light up. Uh, and you're gonna get the uh, Cavendish, Virginia, and Burleys that are cut to a specific ratio, and then it's gonna get put in there, and it's it's really easy to ignite. Um, you're probably gonna go through two matches with a good ribbon cut. Uh, most of the aromatics I carry in the shop are great beginner ones, that's why I brought them in. I didn't bring any, any really sophisticated aromatics in, because I wanted people to be able to light those up and not have to fumble around with it. If you, if you look in there, the only flakes that we have are the Virginia flakes, which are the easiest of the Virginia flakes. Anybody have any questions, Chip? I don't know what Latakia is. So Latakia is a, it's a type of tobacco that's oh, used, it's uh, procured in a very particular way. It's, uh, it's cured in a lot of times these barns. There's, there's different types of Latakia. A long time ago, you used to be able to get a lot more Syrian Latakia from the Syria region. Anymore, it's pretty much impossible to get. There are some that still produce it, but it's becoming really, really expensive to get your hands off. Most of most of the ones you're going to come and counter with are Cypress, um, and uh, or they'll call it Cyprian, um, and that's the one you're going to run into the most. Um, it's basically procured in a barn over flame and the smoke that arises in the barn actually helps to kind of infuse those leaves with a very smoky taste. So when you smoke an air, uh, a English, it's going to taste like a campfire basically. Um, and they're, it's actually really good and it's actually, what I found that the natural progression of smoking, people tend to start with aromatics because it's easy and they're familiar with a lot of the flavors they're getting involved in whether it be apple or honey or whatever it is that they started smoking because it's something they know it's just like uh, cigars a lot of times people start with infused and they start with like cherry flavored and this and that coffee um, it's because what that's what they know people naturally go if you try to give somebody a Maduro cigar from the get-go they're gonna be like wow that's too much for me so you start them off with what they know just like with uh, pipe tobacco start them off with something they know they're gonna they're gonna probably over time want a little bit more out of their blend than casing, so then they want some some more natural nuances, and that's when they start moving over to Englishes, and those Englishes are usually Virginia heavy. Sometimes you'll see some Oriental, some Burley, um, and and some Turkish ones thrown in there, but 
the overall uh, the overall liner for those uh, English blends are Latakia, and so when you swap the ratios over and you go more Latakia to Virginia, you actually start running into what's called a Vulcan, um, and those Vulcans are a little bit more uh, Latakia heavy because um, a lot of people love Latakia. Um, I have people that ask me all the time, can you just sell me Latakia because I'll smoke it straight up. And uh, per, per, not my style, it's like it's like trying to smoke just the wrapper of a cigar uh, to me. Uh, it's a little, little much, um, but um, Englishes are very popular for the next step up from aromatics because they still want that heavy flavor that, that came over from aromatics, but they don't necessarily want it in a casing. So from Englishes, they tend to move on to Virginias. And Burley usually is the last step because it's the sh stronger. I'm not talking about the Burleys they use in, in aromatics, but actual white Burley that they use to smoke and things like that. Um, that's usually the last part of the progression because you got to really have an experienced palate and understanding when you start smoking that. One, it's stronger. And two, it takes a little bit more patience to get the best out of the uh, Burleys and Virginias. Uh, again, Virginias, I smoke a lot of Virginias, but I've smoked for a long time, but they are unforgiving. And if I hadn't smoked a pipe, you know, 10, 15 years beforehand, before getting into Virginias, I probably would have scolded my tongue and it would have been a, a big issue, but it's a natural progression. You'll see, are you still on aromatics? Is it an aromatic pick? Okay. At some point you'll probably, and, and, and an older gentleman once told me this, he's like, uh, I was like, you know what? An aromatic will always work for me. He goes, well, it will until it won't. And he was basically saying, you won't always be there. Don't worry. We got to show everybody what Jeremy's doing. What's that? <laughs> What's this? Oh, yes. You, let's yes. get this on camera. And that's, that's actually not uncommon. Um, you'll see a lot of guys, they'll buy pipes that fit cigars. The one uh, specific size on? for for that, and you can smoke your no, cigar straight on. out of the. Is it still going? Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Fair enough. I may have just gotten taken off that. Am I on? Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, not That's much. Too cool. Yeah. Honestly, it's not much. Honestly, you know what? It looks more cool. sophisticated. So what a lot. <laughs> they don't necessarily do it like that. They'll get down to where it's the nub and it's burning a little hot, right? Because it's close to the mouth. They'll put it inside the, the what's left of their, their uh, cigar. They'll put it in the pipe and they'll light it. And it's like stuff in your bowl and lighten it up. So um, that's not uncommon. You'll see that a lot, actually. I used to do that all the time with a lot of my uh, cigars. I, I, had a, I have a few cigars. And it's usually like a 7 8 board. You'll pop it in there and it fits perfectly. I mean, but there is a few 1316s that fit perfectly, too. Um, Jeremy did that. His IQ went up 10 points. I know, right? Yeah, he so He's trying to fit in. That um, means his IQ is 10 points now. <laughs> 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 um, I'm just kidding, Jeremy. Uh, was there any other questions about blend or about how to light a fire? When's Max going to be here? Yes, Max Dogeby. Yes, he's going to come uh, visit us uh, next Wednesday. He'll be here, he's gonna be doing a blending event. Um, basically, he's gonna go over, you're, there is a buy-in for it, it's about 20 bucks, but you're gonna get a ton of tobacco with it. And with that tobacco, you can blend whatever you want. And basically, he's challenging you to make a blend. And he's got a little tin there for you. You can you can make your own blend, and we're going to actually rate those tobaccos. And whoever wins gets a really nice Peter Stogaby pouch. And these pouches are not cheap, they're those leather uh, cigar pouches. Um, and it's a really cool way of showing people one, what goes into making a blend, and two, put your money where your mouth is, right? Let's see what you can make, you know? Um, and it's it's a really cool process. This, I've been to several uh, blending events, not always competitions involved. In fact, this might be my first if I'm really thinking about it. Um, Are you competing? I'm not going to compete because oh, I want to give you all a chance, okay? No. Um, no, I'll, I'll definitely be uh, judging it in some degree. But um, it's really cool because... Now that we've got pipe tobacco in our store, um, a lot of the pipe blenders and uh, people in the business are taking note, right? Because look, there's other people that sell pipe tobacco, but we're a smoking lounge. That means they can come into our house and they can do these smoking events and we can do these blending events without doing it outdoors and things like that. 
so it's really cool to have guys in the industry taking note and saying, hey, Thunderbird, not only are they doing well with, uh, have pipe tobacco, but they're doing really well with it. So um, take advantage of these moments because um, these are the baby moments where down the road, five years from now, y'all can say, I remember when it all started off and, you know, these guys first started coming here. So that's pretty cool. It's kind of like whenever uh, Jeremy Pryor remembers when Juan Lopez used to come here back when he was pretty much just with Toronto back in the day. And he didn't have a gigantic name yet, but I mean, people knew him, but now he's a right, you know, he comes here like at least once a year and people are like, yeah, Juan Lopez is going to come here. That's not a luxury every cigar shop has. When these guys come, we try to, we, we try to support them. They try to support us because it's an industry that's small and uh, we want to support it as much as we can. So what time is uh, 6.30 next Wednesday um, is when we kick it off. But I'm sure if you come early, he'll be sitting down, enjoying a pipe. Sit down, talk to him, hang out. You know, that's usually how we do it when we have a special guest. Uh, Jeremy's brought us a few special guests between uh, Abe Flores and, and uh, Mike Bellady and, and several others. So, you know, anytime these guys come, you know, that's a luxury not every shop has. Us and Smokies, we're, we're kind of, a, a, you know, a novelty in the area, really. So, and by the way, if y'all don't know this, this guy right here, if y'all have ever been to Smokey Joe's and met Trisha, any of you guys met him? That's her significant other right there. <laughs> so, thank you for coming, by the way. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Thanks to everybody for coming. And what, yeah, what type of tobaccos is he going to bring to play? All of it. So, he's going to bring blending components, right? So, you're probably going to see Virginia's, you're probably going to see Burley's, you're probably going to see Latakia's, and the whole range of fields. Uh, of the field and it's up to you to create something. I've seen some really wonky ideas turn out to be really good ones. Um, one of the master blenders for uh, Cornell and Dill, uh, his name's Jeremy, uh, he might be visiting us hopefully this summer, I hope so. Um, he is notorious for bringing, doing some nutty things with blends that just somehow work. If you guys have not had some of these blends like you know, Bijou and things like that, where they're doing these crazy things. It, it's pretty amazing. Um, we're in a realm of cigars and pipes right now that we've never, uh, generations before us have never seen. We're experimenting in ways we've, we've never seen before. In fact, uh, just going back to cigars, the Mr. Candela that's up there, one of the most oh. unique Candela cigars you'll ever have. Um, it's, it's amazing. I think you guys bought a box, didn't you? Yeah. Or what we did with the white when we used pipe tobacco in the Mr. White. We yeah. used Induyo tobacco. So yeah, going back to cigars, if you guys have not had the Mr. White, if you like pipes, smoke that one because it has pipe components in there. I always get my pipe smokers to smoke that one and 100% of the time they come back and go, spot on. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's in Next the, uh, Tuesday. The white in the white gold edition. Next Tuesday is St. Patty's Day. And next Tuesday, I'm going to be here smoking a green cigar. I'm not having a green beer because i got to work. <laughs> but I'm smoking. And the cigar I'll be smoking is the Mr. Red Candela. That's one of the best Candela. And we've got lots of different Candela. Candela is a tricky thing to do. And I really believe Sinistro did it right. So that'll be a fun thing next Tuesday. What's a Candela? Candela is a very light green wrapper it's not aged thin, and it's aged it's, it's unfermented it's wrapper maybe. so you can use it from different regions we use um in ecuadorian uh connecticut candela um and so it's just unfermented so all the leaves start green and then during the fermentation process is when it changes right the fermentation on a candela is like 48 hours max it's hung up it start it's still green it's still got chlorophyll in it and they pull it down and start the process for curing. What's that new flavor? I think it's very light and grassy flavored. Like, did you ever mow the lawn? Really? You really mowed the lawn? I have mowed the lawn. Well, a long time. But after you mow the lawn and you stick your head in a lawnmower bag because all the stuff got stuck, then you got to pull your lawn the clippings yeah <laughs> that's the experience <laughs> it can be it can be a little harsh but if it's done right and they really did it magnificently yeah. is it true that men have more taste buds than <laughs> tasting lawn 
<laughs> That's true. Uh, only with training. It's not a natural thing. <laughs> only because we have more experience in the area, right? <laughs> um, no, uh, but if you guys have any other questions, it doesn't have to be over the topic. I know smoking a pipe can be frustrating, and sometimes you run into it as you go. But if there's any questions that you had over the last month or so, <clears throat> yes? When is blood rate moving again? Letter of Moon will never be back in. <laughs> now, I, I am trying really hard. Uh, evidently, the, uh, uh, I think it's Quality Importers is who I was buying it from. They seem to believe that we don't sell uh, pipe tobacco to retailers. It's against the law. Um, I don't know if they're confusing us with a non-retailer, you know, uh, but they basically told me, Sorry, we can't sell it to you anymore. I, I don't know why. It was in an email, and then uh, when I when me and Matt asked for the regulation on that, they never really gave it to us. And um, I mean, I have plenty of pipe tobacco that somehow got here illegally, I guess. And so, um, yeah, it's uh, it's weird. Hopefully, it gets worked out. But they did tell me even if if, if that wasn't an issue, they were back order on it. It is one of those really really popular aromatics. Um, yeah. Scott asks, do you recommend pipe blends containing cigar tobacco for experienced cigar smokers? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we actually have one up top, actually, right now. We actually have two. Hi, Scott. Um, one's uh, a new one. I believe it's uh, Seersucker is the name of it. Um, and then there's uh, the most popular one I'm actually out of right now. It's called Billy Blood. It's actually a English with um, uh, cigar leaf in it. Um, if you do research, you'll find that there's probably a good handful of them out there. It's not really, really prominent because the whole thing is, is they're like, well, if you want a cigar leaf, smoke a cigar, you know, type thing, you know, uh, but there are some that have sprinkled it in there and done a really good job. They tend to be more robust, uh, very strong blends, um, on a scale of one to five, they're usually always on the five scale. So, but they're, but they are good. Billy Bud's one of my all time favorites, but it's, uh, <laughs> It's a very stout blend, for sure. What's the best way to pack a pipe while driving? Uh, pull over. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on there? No. I I really want to thank everybody that the old the good old regulars that come all the time. Some of my old buddies. I really want to thank Jeremy, who also, in addition to supplying these cigars tonight, has a selection of lighters and cutters. It looks like some. People got into that, so that's good. Yeah. And stickers, Sinistro stickers. But the last thing I really wanted to show you is this last slide up here. If that's on the, this is Michael, 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 hmm? Prendergast. This is the guy that created this ashtray. And many, many, many other things. He, he's an incredible uh, custom metal worker and a good friend of mine and, and a real great cigar aficionado. And this photo is living proof that there is no wrong way to light a cigar. Um, I don't know what kind of cigar that is. I'm thinking it's probably a Padron. And I'm thinking he probably wasted the first 10 inches of it with that blow torch, but, but there, torch. That, that's a fantastic picture. If I had a cigar company, that'd be on my boxes, so. <laughs> that's Michael Prendergast, and like I said, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This, this is the basic Cigar 101. I really wanted to get this in the, in the can and use it as a reference, so. Oh, and I really, this is serious. This is streaming on YouTube. So far, over the last couple of months, I've actually, we, Jason, actually got not over 90, 90 viewings. I don't know how many, maybe 30 or 40, um, yeah, like 35. 35 subscriptions, but 90 viewings is incredible to me. There's no way we could fit 90 people in this room, but 90 people have had been able to hear and share with us. And if you're watching this now, or if you're watching it uh, on YouTube, please share with any cigar or pipe friends that you have, and let's see if we can make this thing go up over 100. That would just be incredible to me.
and, and help us to continue doing these things. There's nothing monetary about it. You can't, you can't get rich doing cigar uh, podcasts anymore. YouTube's not letting anybody get anything. and It's not all about that. It's all about the friendship of fellow hobbyists in the cigar consumer marketplace and the more people we can reach and the more we can share with the more feedback and input we get the more fun it is so once again thank you all very very much please subscribe if you can please share it and and her fun everybody thank thanks for coming thank you. bravo hey.